from my colleague. Um, I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Kelly Drexler, who's a maternal fetal medicine fellow at UNC, and we collaborated on this project, and I'm so glad that she's here to share some highlights and discuss with us. Excellent. Thanks, Kristen. Let me uh, see if I can share my screen with you guys. Is everybody able to see that okay? Yeah, looks perfect. Great. Excellent. Well, as Kristen said, I am Callie Drexler. I am one of the third year maternal fetal medicine fellows here at UNC. So I'm in my final year of training. Um, this project that I'm going to present on today is a project that I've been working with Kristen and my mentor, Dr. Omar Young, who's one of the maternal fetal medicine attendings here at UNC. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about sort of the findings and sort of what that might um, provide insight for us as healthcare providers or, or people who are patient facing. Um, the goal of today's talk is we're going to talk about lessons learned from psychological trauma from COVID-19 in pregnancy, um, sort of focusing on diagnosis, treatment, and recovery for our patients. So the goals of today's talk, we're going to just quickly review the background of COVID-19 in pregnancy and some of the associated outcomes. And then we'll talk more in depth about the project that we did, specifically talking to patients about psychological trauma surrounding COVID-19 in pregnancy and in the perinatal period. And then at the end, we'll sort of summarize some strategies to help support birthing people who were affected. So briefly, just to talk about COVID-19 and pregnancy, and I feel like at this point in 2023, we're all very familiar, so I won't belabor the point too much, but you know, we know that pregnancy is a risk factor for development of severe disease due to COVID-19 infection. Compared to non-pregnant counterparts, pregnant people are more likely to experience ICU admission, invasive ventilation, preterm delivery, hypertensive disorders, and unfortunately, maternal death. But what do we know about the impact on our mental health? There has been quite a bit, actually, I think, in the literature surrounding the effect of the COVID-19 pandemic on just pregnant and postpartum people in general. And a lot of research has come out showing increased levels of stress, anxiety, and depression as a result of the pandemic. But I think there's really sort of a lack in the literature on specifically what about those pregnant people or birthing people who are specifically infected with COVID-19 in the perinatal period. And there isn't really much out there. Um, there was a survey study that was done um, by a group out of Brigham, and they did um, sort of survey women who were COVID positive during their pregnancy, um, and they were more likely to endorse traumatic stress, or acute traumatic stress related to childbirth. Um, but again, it was a survey study, not something that, serious, that went particularly in depth to ask participants about their experience and sort of what might have led to that increased um, stress that they felt um, surrounding childbirth. And so with that, sort of the goal or motivation of this project was to go in depth and sort of talk to patients. And I'll say that the idea for this project really came when I was on our, our inpatient service in the hospital. And Dr. Young was the attending on service with me. And this was in August of 2022. So sort of the Delta arising Omicron pandemic um, peaks. And we had several patients admitted throughout our time on the service. And one day we were rounding and we were trying to encourage patients to think about, you know, vaccination and things of that nature. And we had so many patients who were undecided. Um, and one day we had just visited the ICU and we had talked to a patient who was, you know, had been intubated and had several complicating, you know, factors in her course. And when a patient subsequently said, you know, I just, I'm not sure, you know, I thought, I wish we could share the stories of the patients who've been affected by COVID-19 in pregnancy so that people could get an idea of sort of what has this disease caused for these patients? Um, because I think as a healthcare provider, certainly I can provide scientific facts and, and research that is available, but what I'm not able to provide is that, you know, first person view of exactly what does it mean when you're diagnosed with COVID in pregnancy and what does that look like when you're the person who's affected severely? And so the point of this project was to sort of do a prospective qualitative study where we included English speaking birthing people who received treatment at a UNC hospital for symptomatic COVID during the pregnancy or perinatal period. The timeline of recruitment was August of 2021 through March of 2022. And essentially what this was is we did semi-structured interviews with participants who were amenable to speaking with us. And the interview guide sort of focused on 
two branches, I would say, but for the purpose of this talk, we'll focus mostly on the emotional trauma aspect of it. But the interview guide was designed to get feedback from our participants on their emotional reactions to developing COVID-19 during their pregnancy, their experiences of their admission or hospital encounters and, and receiving care through the hospital system, and then the impact of that on their mental health, um, both during that um, treatment period, but also um, in their recovery. Um, and I think it's important to note the, the participants that we interviewed, we sort of interviewed people at a range of points. So some of these participants were actually admitted to the hospital with COVID when we interviewed them. Some of them were still pregnant, but had previously been admitted in their pregnancy. And some of the participants were actually in their postpartum phase, but had been admitted at some point throughout their perinatal period. And so sort of a range of time points for when we um, intercepted PH, uh, participants to discuss their experience. Just to give you an overview, so we did have a total of eight participants who um, spoke with us, just to kind of break it down so people can understand sort of what was the background for these patients. Three of the patients had received some form of vaccination um, prior to their diagnosis of COVID, and then five of the patients were unvaccinated at the time of their diagnosis. Um, and as you can see, they're sort of breaking down race ethnicity, nulla parity amongst the participants. Um, I think it's important to note sort of we talk about respiratory support. So I think this helps delineate the severity of the disease that these participants experienced. And so those who were vaccinated, you know, very rare to need um, supplemental oxygen or certainly anything more invasive than that as a composed um, compared to the unvaccinated group where essentially 100% of them required some form of oxygen therapy. And, and for some of those patients, that was intubation in the ICU. Um, and certainly, again, length of stay. So some of these patients were certainly in the hospital much longer or required treatment for longer periods of time. And so when we break down the, the time points at which we kind of elicited feedback from participants, we started sort of with the diagnosis then moved into the treatment period and then recovery. So we'll start with the diagnosis phase. And so themes that came up when asking patients about being diagnosed with COVID-19 in pregnancy, um, feelings of fear, panic and anxiety were endorsed. Um, for some participants, there was hope for a timely recovery initially. And then for some patients, frustration with being diagnosed or the need to be admitted to the hospital. So when we asked patients, how did you feel emotionally when you were diagnosed with COVID-19? These were some of the descriptors that patients provided, scared nervous, apprehensive, afraid, terrified, concerned. Um, so clearly eliciting, you know, concerning emotions. Just to give you some snippets of the interview. So some of the participants responded. Um, so when they said I needed to go to, to go to the hospital, I drove myself to the hospital because I was really focused on my baby living because I didn't think I was going to. And another participant said, I was scared. I felt like my heart just dropped to the pit of my stomach. I was nervous. I was afraid of what could happen. And another participant said, I'm not going to lie. I was very scared when I saw the positive. Of course, you think the worst. I've already, I mean, just being pregnant was a long journey for us. I mean, of course I was terrified. And when I was told, and when I told my mom, she cried, she was really sad. Um, as I mentioned, some patients initially were hoping that this would be a mild course and that they would recover quite quickly. Uh, one participant shared, okay, I have it, I get it, and it's going to be over pretty soon, but it wasn't the case. And another stated, the fact that I didn't feel symptoms at first, I was like, all right, well, maybe this is going to be okay. And another said, I was just hoping that it would be short-lived. Like it would be kind of how you hear people saying, oh, I just had to stay in the house to myself and stay hydrated and da, 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 and then I'm okay. I was just hoping it would be something I could get over like a cold. And I was hoping that it wouldn't be like the other stories I've heard. And other participants expressed frustration either at being diagnosed or being recommended to go to the hospital. And one participant shared, I was, a, I was a little, I think, stressed and kind of frustrated and feeling like, gosh, it finally got us was probably most of it. And another participant, after being told by her healthcare providers that they recommend she go to the hospital for admission, she said, I didn't want to stay. I did not. And I didn't expect to stay that long. Not at all. When we then um, queried patients about their experience with treatment. Um, several themes that came up sort of universally across all of the participants and sort of highlighting those here. We'll talk a little bit about the experience of the physical symptoms that they felt, um, the isolation that came with treatment, as well as the effect that that had on their mental health. And then for some of our participants, the discrimination that they experienced in their in receiving treatment during pregnancy. 
So in regards to physical symptoms, one participant shared, at first I was okay, you know, I had a slight fever and such, but by the end of the day of two or day three, I was not good. I was having body aches so bad that I couldn't feel my baby move, which was very scary. For another participant, it was mainly the fever. I was burning up, I was dehydrated in the cough, and then the body aches, that was even worse. And I didn't notice that I wasn't breathing until after three days when I had it. It was then the breathing was the most painful. And lastly, as a mother and just the way I've grown up, being strong is a big deal to me. And something about the COVID diagnosis, it was as if I usually get through a lot of stuff, but this was like kryptonite in a lot of ways. Like what the heck, because COVID took me down. In regards to isolation, when my husband couldn't come see me, that sent me into depression. I was crying every night. The nurses didn't know because I would be laughing and joking with them. But when I was in there by myself, I'd be crying. And for another participant, that was the hardest part. I'm very much a people person and, you know, my mom wanting to be there for me and not being able to be there in the way of coming to the hospital and not being able to have visitors. It was hard. And lastly, I felt alone. You know, I had my phone and I could talk to family members, but I really felt alone. It was rough. In regards to the effect of on um, mental health for participants, particularly during, you know, those patients who had long stays in the hospital, a couple highlights from some of their responses. It it's like it brought on my depression. I already suffer from anxiety and depression, but by me but by me admitted and having to be isolated like that, it was tough on my mental and I almost had a mental breakdown. I was missing my daughter so much. I was really missing her. And for another participant, for the couple of days that I had it and I was in the hospital, I could tell a difference. Like I almost felt a little defeated. And another participant shared, I didn't like it being in a room all day. I did not like it, but it was just something I had to do, but it was very lonely, very emotional because sometimes I was ready to go home. And lastly, discrimination. And so this particularly was sort of endorsed um, more so by our non um, Hispanic Black participants than any of the other participants in our cohort, but just to share some highlights from their, um, from their stories. One participant said, you know, in regards to talking about some of the nurses that were taking care of them, they didn't care enough to watch how you were talking to me. I wasn't asleep anymore. So maybe you were in there caring for me when I was on the ventilator. And maybe you were saying whatever the heck you wanted to say. And from that same participant, that one night at the hospital with the bad situation with the healthcare staff member, that has messed me up. And I still have some trust issues. And a separate participant shared, I felt like I said, I felt like they discriminated against me. You know, like when you have COVID dialysis, they only do COVID three times a week, the COVID patients three times a week. And by me being pregnant, I had to go to dialysis six days a week for an hour or so. And so she had shared that she was upset because she felt like her dialysis center was not willing to work with her um, given her new diagnosis of COVID and being pregnant, nor were her providers um, out closer to home. And so that is how she ended up admitted to the UNC facility for her care. And then the last thing that we sort of elicited from participants was their um, thoughts about their recovery phase. And so after being discharged from the hospital and returning home, how was the recovery from COVID and their treatment? And several things that came up, one was ongoing self-isolation by participants, the lingering effects on their mental health, as well as some of the lingering physical symptoms as well. So in regards to self-isolating, you know, like now I don't even go out of the house unless I have to. I go to work, the grocery store. My child goes between home and the person who watches her while I'm at work. For another participant, I still feel to this day, I still feel fear as far as doing stuff with people that I'm like friends and stuff, taking the baby. The baby hasn't been held by nobody else other than my husband and me and doctors and nurses when she goes to appointments. We haven't allowed grandparents to touch her or to hold her because of the fear. And for another participant, kind of those panic attacks as far as I don't go to the grocery store because of fear. And the only places I go is the doctor. And if I do, I've been about three times to the grocery store and I see someone who knows me. I just try to hide because it's always like, oh, let me see the baby or let me peek at the baby and that fear. I just try to hide and I just try to avoid calls that, oh, we want to come to your house or that kind of fear. It's like, yes, it's kind of bad as far as that goes. In regards to sort of the lingering effects on mental health, there were several participants who shared um, sort of the ongoing effects from, from their COVID um, diagnosis and treatment. And one patient shared the mental health, the anxiety is still pretty bad as far as I mentioned, family coming over to hold the baby. We just, we can't let them do it because of what we went through. And just, just like the fear, the fear is still there many months after. 
another participant said, when I was released from the hospital, I didn't stay at home by myself for a while. Um, and this quote was from one of our um, participants who delivered um, preterm due to her severe COVID um, disease. And she shared, I can't tell you anything about my baby. I didn't hold my baby. I didn't hold her until she was almost a month old. My husband, he couldn't see her at first because he was recovering from COVID. Nobody was there. I wasn't there for that. I don't have any good memories of her birth and that's horrible. I cry about that all the time. And last, and I think this was something that I wasn't anticipating was several patients or several participants endorsed ongoing physical symptoms that still hadn't improved sometimes even months after their diagnosis and treatment. One participant stated, I still had to get accustomed to walking again, doing things on my own. I didn't have the strength that I had before COVID. I still have afterlying effects that I plan to go to see the doctor about as soon where I don't think my breathing is still the best. I'm having memory. I feel still like I have kind of a fog. And for other participants, I definitely reached a point that I hadn't ever before, if that makes sense. You know, obviously new fears as a new mom. Yes, it definitely took a toll on me mentally for a while, especially even after I got out of the hospital. Like, although I was okay as far as I didn't have COVID, I still did not bounce back until probably the end of January. Like I was drained. I was still like, I mean, my voice was gone. It was that took a toll mentally too. Like I was so over being sick, if that makes sense. And lastly, it was depressing to be a person that worked in healthcare, being a mom, being a wife, and you're always taking care of other people and you know you have to get assistance to go to the bathroom. You need someone to help you walk to the bathroom or you need someone to help you bathe because you don't have the strength you used to have to hold a washcloth. And so I think after um, speaking with the participants and sort of summarizing the information that they shared, I think there were several things that came to light in ways that we can help support our, our patients and, and birthing people who are affected by COVID, um, not just pregnant women in the pandemic, because certainly I think that there's a lot of support that is, is needed in general, but I think specifically for these, for these women and for these um, birthing participants who are themselves affected during their pregnancy. And so one of the things that came out of our discussions with some of the participants was, what can we do? And I think the first step is, is avoid getting COVID. And so, you know, the goal is to sort of discuss vaccination against COVID-19, since we know that the vaccines are helpful in preventing severe COVID. They're recommended in pregnancy by our governing bodies, the CDC and ACOG. At the time that we started this project in the fall of 2021, the CDC had just put out a health advisory that at that time, 97% of pregnant women that were admitted with severe COVID were unvaccinated and only about 30% of the pregnant population at that time was fully vaccinated. I'm glad to share that those numbers have improved. So this is from recent CDC data, um, as recent as the middle of April. So this is looking at the current vaccination rates amongst pregnant people um, in the United States. On the right side of the screen is the primary series, so just initial um, vaccination um, for COVID-19. Um, as you can see there, all races and ethnicities, 71%, roughly 72% across the board, which is much improved from 30% um, just even a year and a half ago. Um, there are some disparities though in the particular um, race and ethnicity populations and who has uh, got uptake of the vaccine, in particular for the primary series, um, Black, non-Hispanic, um, Pregnant people are below sort of the average for all races and ethnicities. And then on the left side of the screen, sorry, the right side of the screen is the bivalent booster. And so this was the most recent recommendation that's come out in regards to vaccination. And that is that all pregnant um, people should have a bivalent booster. Um, and our percentages for that are um, not great. So 23% 20, roughly across the board. And again, as you can see, there are race and ethnic disparities with um, Black, non-Hispanic, and Hispanic um, pregnant people with lower rates for that. And so, as I mentioned, this study, when we initially conceived, it was sort of in two parts. One was to focus on the trauma of being diagnosed and treated with COVID in pregnancy. And the other part of it, which we'll, um, I'll show on the next screen, is that we wanted to discuss with participants decision-making regarding vaccination um, for those who were vaccinated at the time that they were diagnosed, for those that weren't, and then subsequently did they get vaccinated and what were sort of helpful factors in that. And so um, from that aspect of it, we created an educational video with the goal of showing this to our pregnant um, 
population here at UNC, um, particularly for those who are either unsure or undecided about vaccination. And so what I'll show on the next screen is sort of the conglomeration of the video. And we were very fortunate that all of our participants were amenable um, to having some portion of their interview included, whether that was video clips or um, audio recording. And so what I'll do on the next slide is I'll play that video for you guys. Since March of 2020, nothing has ever been the same. The COVID-19 pandemic continues to impact every aspect of American life, leaving us all to deal with the tragic consequences of this insidious disease. Pregnant people are especially vulnerable to COVID-19 as they are more likely to experience high blood pressure disorders of pregnancy, more likely to be admitted to the ICU, and soberingly more likely to die from the disease. Consistently, research has shown that the vaccines available to us significantly decrease the chance of being hospitalized for moderate or severe disease, as well as dying from COVID-19. Disinformation and misinformation around the vaccines have increased hesitancy in the vaccine uptake and prevented a truly strong fight against this pandemic. We as healthcare providers, who only are looking out for the welfare of both you and your baby, strongly recommend that you get vaccinated against COVID-19. With any situation, the choice is ultimately yours. In making your decision, we want you to hear from those who have had COVID-19 impact their pregnancies and their lives post-delivery. These are their stories. I think there was probably a point in time where that would have concerned me to think that I got this vaccine and um, it's not a 100% blocker of COVID, but I think over time, I. And, and accept, I guess, that maybe a lot of the benefit of the vaccine is not preventing all cases of COVID, but preventing severe illness if I were to get it. One of the, I think Dr. Piazza said to me, you, you are here for a reason, be a voice. Let people know about your experience and what action they need to take for themselves. Before you were hospitalized, had you received any COVID vaccine? I had not, no. Okay. Um, and I do wish I had. If I had, I might not have had it as bad. And at first I was okay. You know, I had a little a slight fever and, and such, but like by the end of day two, I was not good. I was having body aches so bad that I couldn't feel my baby move, which was very scary. I definitely reached a point that I hadn't ever before. <laughs> Yeah, it definitely took a toll on me mentally for a while. You know, if a pregnant woman came to you and said, can I get vaccinated? I would tell her yes, if it helps, helps you feel better to protect your immune system. And you don't want to feel like I felt because it was bad. I mean, I would tell them, you know, this is real and you should get uh, vaccinated because uh, you don't want to go to what I went through. Just think about the baby. I can say that. Think about the baby, and then if you, you know, if you want to stay healthy, as far as the baby. A lot more women would get the vaccine knowing that you can have a healthy, normal baby and be vaccinated. But I honestly feel like if I wasn't vaccinated, I don't know what would have happened. As a mother, being strong is a big deal to me. The COVID diagnosis. It was as if I usually do a lot of stuff, but that was like a kryptonite in a way, like, what the heck? Because COVID took me down. I felt very certain that getting vaccinated was the right thing to do for my daughter, to give her sort of one more layer of protection against COVID so that I wouldn't hopefully be the one bringing it home to her and getting her sick when she was so young. People fear what they don't understand, what they don't know. But I think hearing the stories of a mother that had been on the ventilator for three or four months and had yet to see her children. Oh, that bothered me. I was wrong. Um, I had no idea it was going to be that bad. In, in regards to like when you ultimately got COVID. Yes. Yes. So like I thought it was like, okay, well, I have it. I get it and it's going to be over like pretty soon. But it wasn't the case. So I knew it was something real. 
uh, but I just didn't think how bad it was going to affect us. You are growing another human life inside of you. It is important to do all you can to protect that life. And I feel like the best step in doing so would be to get the vaccine because you can, everybody knows what being a parent, you can cross every I and dot every T and something still crazy happens. I'd rather just have the better safe than sorry idea going, knowing I did everything I could do and not feeling regrets later. At the end of the day, if you are pregnant or have recently had a baby, we encourage you to speak to your healthcare provider. While the vaccines will not necessarily stop you from getting COVID-19, the vaccines will decrease your risk of severe disease and the consequences thereof. Get vaccinated, protect those around you, and protect yourself. We hope that these patient stories have provided you some perspective on COVID-19 and pregnancy. We thank all those who have chosen to share their stories. Despite what we may want, COVID-19 is not going away. But what we can control is doing our best to protect ourselves as well as those around us and, like the babies these patients have given birth to, those who are unable to be vaccinated. And so, you know, the goal of this video was to highlight not just obviously the our goal, I think, as healthcare providers to provide information about the benefits of the vaccine, but I think also to sort of achieve our original goal, which was to bring the experiences of pregnant people who've been affected by COVID to those who have not, um, and, and then allow them sort of an inside look into what that experience is like um, to help them in their decision making. Because I feel like that's something as a healthcare provider who's not been in that situation, I can't bring any personal experience to. Um, and so in thinking about everything we learned from talking with our participants, I think there were a lot of follow-up things that I hadn't really given much thought to that I now am much more aware of. And I think the biggest thing is obviously the impact on mental health and not just at the time of when someone's diagnosed or when someone was you know, admitted to the hospital, but I mean, the lingering effects. And so the number of participants that were still experiencing anxiety and, and fear months after they've been diagnosed. Um, and I think it's hard, especially as, as pregnancy providers, you know, we see patients for a window of time. And so I think it really behooves us to be mindful of the fact that someone who maybe had COVID early in their pregnancy might still be feeling those expect, effects postpartum or even longer than, and then the postpartum period when we're seeing them. And so how do we make sure that we identify that or provide a space for patients to bring that up? Um, and how do we make sure that we get them the resources that they need. And so I think obviously screening for these sorts of things is important. And I think as part of our routine prenatal care, we do screen patients for anxiety and depression, but I think being maybe having a heightened sense of awareness or a more frequent screening, particularly for patients who've been affected by COVID in their pregnancy is important. And in terms of follow-up, you know, routinely, at least here in our system, We'll do a mood check two weeks postpartum for you know patients who've got a history of anxiety or postpartum depression, but perhaps having had COVID in pregnancy should be another risk factor, something that we offer patients that you know close follow up postpartum to make sure that we're checking in, particularly now that they have a newborn and we know that a lot of these participants experienced ongoing desire to self isolate and and sort of not engage in their usual support systems due to the fears that they have. Um, another thing, again, the physical symptoms, something that I hadn't um, thought of, and I know. There's a lot of research going into long COVID and sort of what does that mean? And I know that there's research coming out of Utah, hopefully that's going to specifically address long COVID regarding pregnancy. But I think, you know, making sure that we check in with patients, you know, after their diagnosis and, you know, even postpartum, making sure that there's not ongoing symptoms that need addressing or that need specialty follow-up. Um, and then in regards to resources, I think just making sure patients have access to the things that they need. If it's mental health counseling, if it's access to medications, if it's needing physical rehab after you know being diagnosed with severe COVID, if it's needing to see a specialist for breathing concerns or, or things of that nature, um, I think it behooves us to make sure that our patients have access to that. Um, and I think you know as pregnancy care providers, we routinely screen for these things and offer these things. But I think knowing what I know now, I think anyone who's been diagnosed with COVID and pregnancy should be sort of like a, a risk factor, something that should trigger us to be more aware um, because it could be the difference of someone who maybe previously didn't endorse anxiety, depression now has 
moderate to severe symptoms due to what they've experienced. And so um, I think just being mindful of that as we care for these patients um, during their pregnancy and postpartum. Um, I just want to take a quick moment to acknowledge um, the people who made this project possible, obviously our participants who, without whom our stories, um, without sharing their stories, we wouldn't be able to provide this, you know, important information, um, as well as my mentors, Dr. Young and um, Kristen Tully, who um, have been incredibly helpful and have taught me pretty much everything I now know about qualitative research <laughs> um, that I've learned in my fellowship. Um, and have made this project possible. With that, I will stop sharing my screen and I am open to any questions. Thank you, Kelly, and that was excellent. Very moving, um, really, really important for, for empathy and action. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And thank you for your help. And as others are thinking about what they might like to discuss, you know, I wonder, you reflected so beautifully on strengthening the system, you know, based on these learnings. I wonder for both people who've had COVID-19 and everyone else, you know, um, it, what your thoughts are around leading with resources, including postpartum, and, and you touched on this, but I just wondered if you had more because you know we have heard too often right motherhood is so isolating inherently you know um sadly right in the way that that is structured and it no one is overflowing with support and none of us are ever we're, we're trying to thrive not just be okay and not have you know clinically significant um mood scores you know and so do you have any more thoughts around that you know perhaps how to optimize the system yeah I think that's a great question and I don't I mean I don't know that I have specific thoughts other than to I think maximize what we are what systems we already have in place and I think you know as pregnancy providers we see patients frequently, which I think is a bonus. I mean, we see people sometimes weekly, you know, depending on where they are in their pregnancy or how um, complicated their pregnancy care may be. And so I think utilizing the time that we have with patients in the time that we have it. So making sure that we're actively engaging patients in discussions about their mental health. And I think preparing patients for what comes after delivery. And I think, you know, if we take those opportunities to say, we've been through a lot, right? And so, and we know postpartum is going to be tough. You know, what can we do to get measures in place now to support you so that when, you know, you have a newborn at home, you feel like you've got access to the things that you need. I think the challenge is always re accessing resources. And I think it's a variable across the country. It's variable depending on what your insurance is. It depends on where you live and, and how far that is. You know, in the state like North Carolina, where we have patients who come to get care at UNC from three hours away, right? They don't have a plethora of psychiatric providers nearby or counselors or therapy services. Um, and so I think here we try to act, you know, we have research initiatives and things that are ongoing through our um, perinatal mood clinic where patients can access things like talk therapy and stuff like that, that occurs via telehealth, or at least trying to access, you know, services that maybe don't necessarily mean showing up in person at your local healthcare facility, but being able to reach people where they are. Um, and I think my hope is that we're able to continue to offer things like telehealth services in the future, because I think that's one of the big things I think that's been helpful and has come out of the pandemic is that we're allowed, we're able to provide more access, you know, whether patients choose that or not is certainly up to them. But I think being able to offer someone who lives four hours away, um, the ability to connect with someone over the phone or over video. Um, and I think that's also allowed us to have more contact postpartum, you know, we're able to do a mood check with someone from home, they don't have to come in to fill out the PHQ-9 or the EPDS screen, right? Like we can talk to them over the phone and say, hey, how are things going? Um, and so I think being able to sort of maximize the time that we have with patients while they're in our care. I think using that time to set them up for success once they're no longer in our care. Um, you know, I think a part of that will help as people are expanding access to Medicaid and other services for the year after they're delivering. And so my hope is that we're able to sort of capitalize on what we have, um, knowing that obviously there's limitations that I don't know that we can address as easily.
And if you want to um, direct your attention to the chat and maybe read it out loud and, and respond, Kelly. Yeah, so Rachel asks, is there any validity in delaying COVID booster vaccination until later in pregnancy so that the fetus or baby gets more antibodies closer to delivery? I've heard of some patients opting for that. You know, I don't know of any, I couldn't cite you any resources or, or papers that have addressed that. Um, I think the majority of what people are assessing is, is there transplacental passage of immunity, meaning that, you know, pregnant people who get vaccinated or immunized during their pregnancy, are they able to pass that on to, to their babies? Um, and so the answer to that is yes. I don't know that anyone has been able to show that there's a benefit, for example, waiting until you're in your third trimester to get your booster for that specific purpose. I think the goal of the recommendation for the booster is for maternal protection first. Um, and so obviously the sooner you have that, the less likely you are to have a severe COVID infection in pregnancy. And so I think that's the number one goal of the vaccination or the boosters. But um, I think in someone who wants to maximize immunity potentially, but I don't know that we have any data thus far to suggest that that would be beneficial or more beneficial, but that's a good question. Um, there was another question from Sana that says, what are some of the challenges that you might have identified or experienced in providing the telehealth services? Um, I think, one of the biggest challenges is connectivity, right? So some of our participants don't have access to internet or don't have a reliable cell phone service. And so then if that's our mainstay of trying to connect with them and we can't reliably do that, that's that's challenging. Um, I think the other thing is that there's a lot of distractions at home or wherever they are. And so it's very different when someone comes to the clinic and they're sitting one-on-one -on -one with you and you're in a space that is sort of isolated in that regard. And so then being able to have conversations that get into you know, mental health or other um, subjects, I think, are a little bit less distracting than when someone's at home, they've got a newborn and there are other kids around, or they're trying to do other things at the same time, um, or they may not be in a safe place, right? So if we're worried about intimate partner violence or or some other family members, or there's been other social concerns, right? We don't want to address those things um, in, a, in a place where we can't be certain that the patient's going to feel safe talking about that. Um, so I think those are sort of the big concerns that have, have come up for the most part is being able to access people that way. And then also just making sure that we have a sort of safe space to do that when we do call them. Um, let me just see what else is in the chat here. Um, Suzanne, you asked, I'm curious what innovations are on the horizon with digital apps and telehealth, especially in rural and in different languages. I suspect there will be a lot of things coming down the pipeline is my hope. Um, I know that there are a lot of, I think there's been a, quite a bit of um, increased access to mental health care providers, I think via telehealth. There's apps that you can get where you can sign up for a counselor or a therapist, or they can match you with someone based on your insurance. And so um, my hope is that that will be coming down the pipeline. I personally am not involved in any of that um, research right now. <laughs> And to tack on that, I wondered about um, if there was any trust, if you had noticed any like trust issues one way or the other when it came to the in-person visits versus telehealth, like if there seemed to be like a mistrust being open um, or saying things as bluntly on a video or a webcam telehealth visit versus in person and having the person document. I'm curious which one would possibly garner more trust or does it get impacted at all? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's, um, I think it's variable. I think, and I, I want to say people have looked into this, but I think from a patient perspective, there are some people who feel more comfortable opening up or discussing when they're in the office, one-on-one, -on -one, having a face-to-face -face conversation. And then I think for other people, maybe it's that removed aspect where they're at home in an environment where they feel more comfortable, where they feel that they can open up more easily. Um, I think I think a lot of, particularly when I think of our patients who've got, you know, complex social situations, it depends, right? Like being, coming to the clinic may mean they don't have to come with their children and with their partner or with their family members, and therefore they're alone. And I think that opens a safe space. But for others, it may mean when I do a telehealth visit, you know, on my lunch break, it, you know, my partner isn't there, right? And, and you know, I can have space to myself if that person is someone that often accompanies them to visits or, or is around the house and we want them overhearing their conversation. And so I think it goes both ways. And I think it's important that we elicit that information from patients, right? When we ask them about the option for a telehealth visit um, and give them the option to say, you know, I don't think that's gonna work well for me, or actually, you know what, that sounds great um, because I think it's gonna be patient specific on, on what's the best option for them. 
Um, and then I think there's one more question in the chat from Jessica. If we know the peak coverage for booster is three to six months, if given at the beginning of pregnancy or wait until later for coverage of more of the third trimester. Um, again, I think, I think this, I think the inherent question is, is what's the purpose of the booster? And I think if we're doing it for maternal safety, then the goal would be to do it when someone is pregnant. Um, and so I don't know that doing it in the end of the first trimester versus the end of the third trimester, you know, I, I think it depends on what your goal is. If your goal is for maternal safety at any point in pregnancy is the recommendation, regardless of sort of when the max amount of booster um, sort of responses. Um, if your goal is to dually get maternal coverage as well as potentially pass on IgGs, you know, to the baby, you could posit that doing it later in the pregnancy might be better for that. Um, I think the other important thing though, is that breastfeeding has been shown to be another method in which we're providing immunity. And so for those patients who plan to breastfeed, that can be another method in which they can, you know, provide immunity for their, for their infants. And so someone who gets a booster, let's say, you know, before they're pregnant. And so then when they become pregnant, they're not eligible. They, you know, could still potentially pass that immunity on, um, through breastfeeding potentially. I have more to, you know, go back, loop around to the quality of care during the inpatient and the discrimination, um, or one of the examples you shared. Um, and I think opportunities range in intensity, let me put it that way. Like, you know, and I think one of the examples was the maybe the nurse or team member didn't realize the person was awake. And so saying things are like, um, and so, and then it can range from direct interactions and really escalations. And so I'm well aware of that. I just, I wonder if you've reflected and have any more to share around what it feels like to be treated and how we can learn in this, and sometimes with quite severe cases, but how that might inform your work and recommendations more broadly. Yeah, I think in this particular setting where we were talking with these participants, I think the specific example that I provided a quote from, um, you know, I think the challenge for, for that participant was that at the time that she was receiving care, she felt like she was trying to voice to the care team that she had some concerns um, and was sort of not taken seriously. And I think it was in the context of like she, they were, I think were worried about her, um, her mental clarity at that point. I think there was some concern for like ICU delirium or just having been in the hospital for a while. And I think that aggravated the situation where she had genuine concerns about stuff that she had overheard or experienced from the healthcare provider specifically. And when trying to voice those concerns was sort of told like, I mean, not to say this, but this was part of the quote was that she was being told she was being crazy is what they were telling her. Um, you know, after the fact, when we had talked to her about this and she shared this story with us, which I don't know if she shared it with her care team and, you know, during her pregnancy, when we spoke with this participant, they were um, postpartum. Um, but, you know, we, wanted to ensure that they had an avenue in which they could raise those concerns, even if it was months later, right? I think just to, to make it clear that, you know, that experience had occurred. And so providing her with the opportunity to kind of speak with a patient's relations person and um, express what had happened to her. Um, I think the interesting thing, which I didn't touch on particularly, but many of the participants actually endorsed um, like gratitude towards the care teams, you know, and I think that despite being isolated and and not, um, and obviously not having visitors and, and not having people spend a lot of time in their room, they were quite grateful for um, the care that they received. And so it's sort of, um, I think what makes it interesting is sort of that stark contrast. And I think particularly because that feedback regarding discrimination and the mistrust came from, um, you know, participants who were non-Hispanic Black, right? Like that difference in the care that was received between those participants and others. Um, and I think it behooves us to maybe elicit that, right, from our patients if they don't 
necessarily openly share that with us, but just to make sure that people are feeling that they're receiving the care that they deserve and want. And um, if that's not the case, offering them the option or the an avenue in which they can provide that feedback um, anonymously or, or otherwise. Sorry, I'm just reading your comment in the chat somewhere. Or Jessica, thank you. <laughs> and have you had feedback about the video? Yeah, so we actually were able to share the video at one of our conferences. Um, and we are in the process of getting it up and running in our clinics here at UNC. But I think the feedback has been overwhelmingly positive. Admittedly, have not gotten feedback from patients who have watched the video yet. I think that'll be the next step would be to, to get feedback from the target audience in general. Um, I know a lot of the people who have um, viewed the video are most often healthcare providers at this point or have viewed it from like a research perspective. And so I think it'll be, um, it'll be good to get it out there and sort of see if it's helpful for the, for the people that we intended it for. Great. Are there any other questions or comments? I will just read out loud. I appreciate uh, Jessica Summers for you sharing your experience about giving birth during the pandemic um, and having a baby in the NICU during the lockdown. Um, I appreciate you know your appreciation for the research and for joining us. Um, I also put in the chat an evaluation form for um, for today's session. Here's the QR code for it. Wouldn't mind taking it taking a minute to do that. And then our next upcoming community of practice is May 25th. Um, it'll be about um, cardiac conditions and heart health in the fourth trimester project. More details are on the, are coming on that. Um, you can always submit questions in advance for our presenters. It also is really helpful for them to um, to craft their presentations to towards you know what you're hoping to to get out of it. So anything heart related that you'd like to hear from. Um, you can go ahead and submit it and I'll put the link in the chat. It's that about M NCMHI link. Um, you can always watch the recorded sessions. The session was also recorded um, on our MHI hub. It's newmomhealth.com forward slash about NCMHI. That's where you'll find the community of practice recordings, upcoming events, things like that. And then just a note that uh, Mother's Day is in two weeks, whether you're celebrating or you are uh, asking ads not to show them to you. I understand, but we um, we will be sending out just some positive affirmations and messages related to maternal health and those who care for um, for moms and birthing people. We have a maternal health warning signs video coming up. It's underway with Nurse Nikki. This is taking our new parent health one pager that has the maternal health warning signs when to call 911 when to call your health provider. And then on that whole left uh, right column where it's talking about like really important recovery information related to postpartum, we're turning that into little video reels that are like 90 second YouTube short Instagram reels that are really shareable and help, um, help moms and providers to just easily share this information and, and make sure the families and support teams are aware of those urgent maternal health warning signs. So that is underway. Um, and we'll keep you updated on when that is live. And then just a note for our North Carolina um, MHI sites, you can order all of these, these tools that we've created with these experts for free from the North Carolina warehouse. Um, there's the warehouse form, I can put it in the chat. Um, there, the care plan, the postpartum care plan that's meant to be filled out with the birthing parent and her, the care team is not in the warehouse currently, but you can email me and we'll get you a shipment of it. And the new parent health one pagers are also, I believe they're still not in the warehouse yet. They will be there this summer or fall. Um, but in the meantime, we are able to ship them to you. So just reach out to me with how many copies you need and we'll get it shipped. And with that, I thank you so much for joining our session today. A special thank you to Dr. Kelly Drexler. This was such an amazing conversation. This was such important and impactful work. Um, I hope it touched your hearts. Um, thank you for those who shared your questions and your messages with us. Um, and I really appreciate everyone. Have a great day. Bye.